you have your Bibles, please open to Luke chapter 2. Um, it says 25 on the screen, but I think we're probably going to begin in about verse 22. We've been talking all season long about uh, God's name, Emmanuel. Jesus came, and according to Isaiah, uh, one of his names was to be Emmanuel, which Matthew helpfully translates for us as God with us. And so we've talked each week about how God with us brings us hope and how God with us brings us love and how God with us brings us joy. This morning we're talking about how God with us brings us peace. And we've had fun with each week of Advent talking about some of the behind the music stories of our most well-loved and famous Christmas carols. And so we talked about Isaac Watts, 1674 to 1748, and his song, Joy to the World. We talked about Charles Wesley, one of the founders of the Methodist Church with his brother John, 1707 to 1788, and his song, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. We talked about a Frenchman named Placide Capot, uh, 1808 to 1877, who left us with O Holy Night. And so added to that, this morning, I'd like to talk about Travis Tritt. <clears throat> I know what you're thinking. It's that old Sesame Street song, one of these things is not like the other. Uh, and, and for what it's worth, uh, I've got up there Travis Tritt, 1989 to present. Uh, Greg Jones, of course it was Greg Jones, uh, came to me after the first service and he said, you got to change that. He wasn't born in, 19, in 1989. And he's right. I did some fact checking on Wikipedia because they're always right about everything. 1989 was when this particular album uh, came out. Travis himself was born in 1963. So thanks for that, Greg. Uh, and you might be wondering, why are we talking about Travis Tritt? Because, you know, you look at some of these other hymn writers and O oh, Four Thousand Tongues to Sing and When I Survey the Wondrous Cross and Christ the Lord is Risen Today and Hark the Herald Angels Sing and Travis Tritt gave us Here's a Quarter, Call Someone Who Cares and The Whiskey Ain't Working. So why are we talking about him when we're talking about these other guys? But really, there is a, a reason for this. See, even though Travis Tritt is a pretty big name in country music now, he didn't start off that way. Travis Tritt actually in his early years was known for playing out-of-the-way juke joints and honky-tonks and redneck bars. I mean, if you imagine just like gravel parking lots and F-150s and Harley Davidsons in the parking lot and all of them have gun racks, even the Harley Davidsons, that's the kind of place that Travis Tripp played, and some of you guys are, are nodding a little bit too knowingly, um, if, if I'm being honest with you. Uh, we may need to talk later this week, but you know what I'm talking about. And that's where Travis Tritt got his start. And there were nights in those juke joints and honky-tonks when things got a little bit rough. And in an interview several uh, years ago, Travis Tritt said that one night when a bar brawl, when a bar brawl broke out, <laughs> try saying that three times fast, bar brawl broke, I can't even do it, Tritt tried to do something that wound up working out so well that any time uh, tempers flared after that, this is what he did. Tritt said, just when things started getting out of hand, when bikers were reaching for their pool cues and rednecks were heading for the gun racks, I started playing Silent Night, and people calmed down, and they stopped in their tracks, and they put the pool cues down, and they took their hand off their holsters, and grown men even started crying, and I did it every time after that. It could be the middle of July, sweat pouring off my body, and there we are in the honky-tonk singing silent night holy night all is calm all is bright round yon virgin mother and child holy infant so tender and mild sleep in heavenly peace sleep in heavenly peace what is it about those lyrics that would make the rowdiest biker and redneck burst into tears 
Is it about the baby sleeping in heavenly peace? Or is it the promise that the baby himself is the prince of peace and the bringer of peace? The truth is there's people in our world today that are looking for peace. Maybe that's the reason that some of the folks that Travis was singing to were in the bar in the first place. They're looking for peace. They're looking for love in all the wrong places. And today, I'm here to tell you some good news that peace is in our world. And you might be scratching your head going, how is that even possible? Do you watch the news? If you watch the news, you know that this is the week that the stock market tanked and this is the week that there's tensions in Syria and Afghanistan and are we going to pull out or are we going to stay in and, and uh, all this turmoil and a government shutdown. How can you stand here, preacher, and say that peace is already in our world and that's just the news. Have you met my family? This week, a lot of you are going to be going back to, to in-laws and outlaws and relatives that you don't see all year long, and a lot of you don't even like them. And you're thinking, if you could sit at our kitchen table, at our dining room table, would you still be talking about peace on earth? Yes, I would. Because here's the truth. There are some of you here this morning that don't come to church all that often. There's some of you here that uh, will be here again at Easter, and I may not see you in between time. And you really don't take all of this seriously. You're here because that's what people do at Christmas time. But you're looking for peace. And I want to tell you this morning that peace on earth not only is possible, peace is already here. Scripture passage for today tells the story of two precious senior adults, a man named Simeon and a woman named Anna, who experienced peace when they experienced Jesus one day in the temple. Now let me give you a little bit of context for this. This is after Jesus was born, and by this point Jesus is about a month old. Mary and Joseph have brought him to the temple on this day because the Old Testament law required that after 33 days, the firstborn child was to be brought to the temple in order to be redeemed. In order to be redeemed, Leviticus 12 specifies that a family, if they could afford it, had to bring a male lamb, a year old, to be sacrificed. If they couldn't afford it, they had to bring uh, two doves or two young pigeons to pay the redemption price for a firstborn child. And so that's why Mary and Joseph were in the temple that day. So we're going to pick up in Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 22. If you are physically able, I want to invite you to stand and honor the reading of God's word, which says this, When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him, Jesus, to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was an, a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and it will be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. 
There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. You may be seated. May God bless the reading of his word. As you're seated, would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, Lord, that you are the Prince of Peace. And if we're being honest, there's a lot of us that don't feel very peaceful this morning. There's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of family dynamics and family dysfunction. There's a lot of illness. There's a lot of turmoil. 2018 has been a hard year for a lot of people. And so even those of us who have walked with you for years and years and years, we don't always feel the peace that you promised to bring. So I pray, Lord, that this morning we would understand what you meant by peace on earth and goodwill toward men. Please help me to be a faithful mouthpiece for your word. Help me to let your word speak for itself. And Lord, if there's anything uh, that might come from this stage that does not bring honor and glory to your name, I pray, Father, that it would be very quickly forgotten. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So Simeon and Anna were waiting for something. They've been waiting for a long time. And the first question that comes to mind is, well, what were they waiting for? Let's look at Simeon first. It says in verse 25 that this man was righteous and devout and he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Now, this phrase, the consolation of Israel, what does it mean? Well, consolation is a Greek word or it comes from a Greek word uh, which is paraklesis or paraklesis uh, and it means comfort or solace. It's a nice thought, isn't it? Who doesn't hope for comfort and solace and relaxation? Who doesn't hope for that in their lives? I can tell you that uh, I love the days when I come home from work and I change into my comfy clothes, right? I change into my comfy clothes and if there's nothing else to do, uh, Trish and I will sit on our comfy couch and if it's cold in the house, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll pull a comforter over ourselves and we'll sit there in our comfy on our comfy couch in our comfy clothes with our comforter eating comfort food and watching Hallmark movies because that's what you do men it's what you do just deal with it you man card still intact just go home and watch Hallmark movies because that way you can have peace on earth um, and sometimes that's what we think of when we think of comfort. But I have to tell you that when Simeon was looking for the consolation of Israel, he was looking for a lot more than fleecy PJs and Hallmark movies. And to understand this, understand that in the New Testament, paraclesis, comfort, or, or solace, it's not just a feeling or an emotion. Jesus used this word too when he was with his disciples on his last night with the disciples. John 14, 15, and 16, Jesus begins in John 14 saying, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. And he used a form of this word, paraclesis, but slightly different. See, paraclesis is an emotion. It's comfort or solace. Jesus used the word parakletos, which is a person. He said, there's going to be a parakletos, one who is called alongside you. It's translated in various ways. New International Version usually uses advocate, uh, English Standard Version uses helper. Christian Standard Bible uses counselor. King James Version uses comforter. But they're all the same word, parakletos, which is similar to paraklesis. 
and it means one who brings comfort. And so Jesus told these disciples who were scared, who were confused about what was going to happen next, who didn't know what Jesus meant with all this talk about this is my body, this is my blood. They're scared. And Jesus says, guess what? I'm going to pray to the Father and he will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Not that you will have comfort forever, but there will be a comforter with you forever. John 14, 26, the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. He will bring all things to your remembrance, whatever I've said to you. John 15, 26, but when the comforter, that parakletos, comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, he is the spirit of truth who proceeds from my Father, he will bear witness about me. See, understand this. This is the good news of the gospel. It's not that we're going to feel better, but it's that someone will be called alongside us to comfort us, to help us, to speak for us, to counsel us. See, that is what is different between Christianity and every other religion in the world. Religion seeks to give us rules or principles to live by. Christianity gives us a person to follow. Religion helps us feel better. Christianity helps us be better because of this comforter. Rather than giving us a set of principles to walk by, Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit to walk with us. And it's all the difference in the world. And Simeon had been waiting for years for this. Holy Spirit had told him, you will not die before you see the consolation of Israel. And so what happens? Simeon takes the consolation of Israel in his arms. And he looks at this flesh and blood baby. And he says, this isn't just an emotion. This isn't just a good feeling. The consolation of Israel is a person, and I'm holding him in my arms. And he looks at him and he says, Sovereign Lord, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. Do you think he was looking up at heaven saying, Sovereign Lord? Or do you think he was looking down at his arms saying, Sovereign Lord? You may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation. Comfort is a person. And Simeon saw him. That's what Simeon was waiting for. What about Anna? What was Anna waiting for? Luke tells us that Anna was a prophet who had married young and widowed young. Translations differ. Some say she lived after being married for seven years. She lived as a widow for 84 years which would have made her around 100 years old at this time. Other translations say that she was a widow until she was 84, so she'd be 84 at this time. But either way, she had been waiting for a long, long time for something. What had she been waiting for? Verse 38 says uh, she spoke to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Redemption is a Greek word, litrosis, meaning ransom or deliverance from sin. Now, I talked to you a little bit about what Mary and Joseph were doing in the temple that day. This tradition or this commandment to redeem the firstborn went all the way back to the book of Exodus. You remember God's people had been in bondage in Egypt for 400 years. And on the last night that they were in Egypt, God instructed the Israelites, go out and slaughter a lamb and paint the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of your house and stay inside the house. And it shall come to pass that when I send my destroying angel through the streets of Egypt, if it sees the blood of the lamb, then he will pass over that house and all who are inside under the blood of the lamb 
will be saved from the destroying angel. And after they were delivered from bondage in Egypt, on Mount Sinai, God made an ordinance which was to be obeyed for all generations to come that the firstborn male belonged to God. And parents were required to redeem, to buy back that firstborn male, either with the blood of a lamb or with two doves or two young pigeons. That was the price of redemption. So this word litrosis, you only see it three times in the New Testament. But you see the concept of redeeming back, of buying back the one all through the Old Testament. And so by Jesus' day, the Israelites began to see this as metaphoric because they understood that they themselves, the nation of Israel, was God's firstborn. And they saw themselves as under oppression from the Roman government. And they were looking for the one who would redeem Jerusalem. Some of you in Sunday school, you learned about how uh, the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom, uh, was, was taken over by Assyria in about 722 B.C. And about 100 years later, the southern kingdom of Judah, where his capital, whose capital was Jerusalem, was overrun by the Babylonians. And so they've been in exile and they came back and now they're under Roman rule. And so they're looking for someone who's going to redeem Israel who's going to redeem Jerusalem. And they've been looking for him for a long, long time. And on this day, Anna sees him. Now understand this. According to the theological dictionary of the New Testament, this word litrosis for redemption or deliverance says the reference is not to a ransom, but to a redeemer. In other words, it's not the price that is paid, but the one who pays the price. Not an amount, but again, a person. Remember the story of the two disciples that were on the way to Emmaus the day that Jesus was resurrected? This is in Luke chapter 24. Two disciples are leaving Jerusalem. They're on their way to Emmaus. Jesus himself comes and walks alongside them. They don't recognize him. He says, hey guys, what are you talking about? And they say, are you, what, have you been under a rock for the last three days? You don't know what's going on in Jerusalem? And Jesus says, well, yeah, kind of. I've been under a rock. Tell me what's going on. And they tell him. And they say, about Jesus of Nazareth, he was a prophet, mighty and powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. And they go on, they say, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Not a price that is paid, but one who pays the price. The only other time this word is used in the New Testament is in Hebrews 9.12, where the writer of Hebrews, talking about Jesus, says that the Redeemer has come, that we have redemption not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He has entered Israel once and for all, into the holy place, having obtained eternal litrosis, redemption for us. Friends, you see the gospel in this. Meditate on this phrase. Our redemption is not a price. Our redemption is the one who pays the price. So many times, those of us who are caught up in religion, we think that it's the price that we have to pay. We think that it's the things that we have to do, that we have to dress up and go to church, and we have to put money in the offering, and we have to uh, tone down our language and not cuss so much, and we have to stop going to the honky-tonk on Friday night to hear Travis Tritt. We have to do all of these things things in order to pay the price for our redemption that's religion christianity says the price has already been paid that's jesus not redemption but a redeemer not rules but a relationship and if you're looking for peace you aren't going to find it in religion you will only find it in relationship. 
Now, how did Simeon and Anna know to be looking for it? Because the Bible tells us so. 700 years before, the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 40 says this, and if you know Handel's Messiah, you can almost sing this with me. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, says your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. 700 years before Jesus was born, the prophet Isaiah says there's going to be comfort brought to Jerusalem. And the message of comfort coming from the comforter is this. Your warfare is accomplished. The fighting is over. You don't have to fight anymore. You know what Jesus said on the cross, John 1930, I think it is, uh, when Jesus, his last words on the cross were, it is accomplished. Your warfare is accomplished. Your iniquity is pardoned. Your sins can be forgiven and you don't have to fight anymore. There can be peace on earth. Three things quickly that we learn from Simeon and Anna about God with us is that number one, we can live life in peace. We can live life in peace. Now I want to be clear. This doesn't mean a life without division. Look closely at what Simeon said to Mary in verse 34. He said, This child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is to be opposed. That doesn't sound like peace on earth, goodwill toward men. It kind of sounds like Jesus is going to be a dividing point for people to either choose him or reject him. And we've kind of bought into that. We've kind of said, okay, I'm going to go see my family this weekend. Uh, not all of them are at church. And so, you know what? We're just going to avoid talking about religion when we see each other. Why? Because we want to keep the peace. Jesus himself said, don't suppose, this is Matthew 10, verse 34, don't suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth like wait a minute didn't you say peace on earth goodwill toward men wasn't that what the angel said uh, back on the hillside to the shepherds that you were coming to bring peace on earth goodwill toward men Jesus says don't think that I've come to bring peace on earth I've not come to bring peace but a sword I tell you the truth verse 35 I've come to set a man against his father a daughter against her mother a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law you're going wow you've come to my family dining room table on Christmas you get this this is my family we put the fun in dysfunction I've come to set a man against his father a daughter against his mother and a person's enemies will be those of his own household wow Jesus is a dividing point for a lot of people because you have to make a choice one way or the other to decide not to decide about Jesus is to decide and that means to reject him. So Jesus, it doesn't mean that it will be a life without division. In fact, you're pretty much guaranteed you will have division if you choose to follow Christ. It also doesn't mean a life without heartache. Look at what Simeon said to Mary. Mary's holding this little month-old baby boy her pride and joy. And Simeon looks into the future under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and he says, Mary, a sword will pierce your heart also. Because Simeon could look into the future and see a day when Mary would be at the foot of a cross Staring up at her beaten and bloodied and crucified pride and joy, Jesus Christ, who is hanging there between heaven and earth, absorbing God's wrath and the sins of all humankind. Mamas, can you imagine the sword piercing her heart at that moment? We will never experience the heartache that Mary experienced, but we all experience heartache. We all know the pain of a fractured relationship with a family member. And even when things are good, we all know the heartache of sending a son or a daughter off to college. Fathers know the heartache mixed with the joy of watching a daughter 
go back down the aisle as somebody else's husband. And peace on earth doesn't mean a life without heartache. Some of you are here and you don't come to church very often. And I don't want to lead you astray to think that Christianity means a life without heartache. Jesus said in John 16, 33, In this world you will have trouble, but be encouraged, I've overcome the world. If you sign on with this, if you choose to follow Christ, you will have heartache. So if it doesn't mean a life without division, and if it doesn't mean a life without heartache, what does it mean that Jesus came to bring peace on earth? Well, first and foremost... Jesus came to bring peace between us and God. Paul says in Romans 5, We have been justified by faith and we therefore have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In Ephesians 2, he says, Remember that at one time you were separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Some of you are there at this very moment. You're strangers and aliens to the promises of God. And you're without hope as long as you're without God. And if you're being really, really honest, you know that just because you show up for church at Christmas time, it's not going to make you right with God. And right now you're living without peace. And if that's you, then pay attention to the first two words of verse 13, which may be the greatest words in the entire Bible. But now. But now in Christ, you who are once far off can be brought near. How? By the blood of Jesus. For he himself is our peace. He's made us both one, has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. That he might create in, a, in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. It's a lot of words, but what it means is that when Jesus came, the law and the commands were fulfilled. And so we don't come to him by, having to, by obeying all of the Old Testament laws and commands. We come to him and surrender our lives and trust Jesus that the work has already been done, that he has already paid the price, that he's already fulfilled the commandments, and that we don't have to work so hard to be right with him. He came and preached peace to those who were far off and peace to those who were near. And it's my privilege as a pastor to preach peace to you who are far off. You who aren't involved in church, who don't come all that often, who don't really take this seriously, but you're out there fighting battles by yourself that you don't have to fight. Trying to be good enough on your own. Trying to make it without a counselor in this world and make right decisions for your family. And you're not doing it very well. And so I get to preach to you peace to those of you who are far off. I get to pe preach peace to those of you who are near. Some of you who have walked with Jesus for a long time. But you feel far, far from this peace that God promises. Because you're still fighting and you're still trying to do it on your own. And the message is the battle is over. Jesus has won. We can live life in we can live life in confidence. Number two, we can leave life with confidence. Simeon says, Sovereign Lord, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. Because of Jesus, Simeon was prepared to die. Simeon had done all that he was supposed to do. The Bible says that he was righteous and devout. Righteous is typically how Luke describes somebody's conduct with other people. And so Simeon was a businessman with integrity. He was a good neighbor. He was a trustworthy friend. He was righteous with other people. And he was devout, which means he did everything he could to be right with God. 
But understand that being righteous with other people and being devout towards God was not enough for Simeon. He, could still, he couldn't just with that be dismissed, be dismissed in peace. He needed something else. And so do we. It's not enough to be a good neighbor. It's not enough to just show up for church. Simeon said, you can dismiss your servant now in peace. Why? Because I've encountered Jesus. My eyes have beheld your salvation. I'm holding it right here, a little nine-pound, one-ounce salvation right here in my arms. And because of that, I can go in peace. I can face death without fear. Because I've beheld salvation, we can live life in peace. We can leave life with confidence. And number three, we can give our lives in surrender. Knowing that Jesus has come as our Prince of Peace, knowing that he's already paid the price and surrendered his life for us, gives us the freedom to surrender our lives right back to him. And one of the amazing things about the Christmas story is that every single person in the Christmas story had to surrender something. You think about it. Elizabeth and Zechariah, old couple, Senior adults who had long since given up the idea that they would have children. And the angel Gabriel comes and says, guess what? Those social security checks you've been getting, you're going to be spending on pampers for the next you know, nine months from now. That's some surrender, isn't it? Any senior adults want to sign up for a newborn? <laughs> I didn't think so. That's what grandchildren are for, right? They had to surrender. They had to surrender their plans, and they had to surrender the idea of, hey, we're retired. Let somebody else do it now. Guess what? The church still needs our senior adults. We still need you to engage. We still need you to plug in. We still need you to teach the rest of us who are pretty clueless about how to adult. We need you. Mary and Joseph, young people on the other side of the spectrum, what did they have to surrender? They had to surrender their dreams for uh, planning their own lives. They had to surrender their reputations. Nazareth's a small town, and here they are with an unplanned, unwed pregnancy and some weird excuse that it's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> yeah, right? Joseph has to surrender some of his pride as he talks to his friends down at the carpentry shop. Mary has to surrender her pride as the other ladies at the well are watching her and whispering behind their hands. They've got to surrender the idea of, of being able to kind of do their own thing and being able to you know, check out a church every once in a while and go to the lake instead. Why? Because they're raising the Son of God. Men who know that you're supposed to be the spiritual leaders of your household, can you imagine the pressure of raising the Son of God? There's some surrender to that. The shepherds had to surrender um, their flock. Who do you think watched the flock by night when the shepherds went to Bethlehem to see this thing which the Lord had made known to them? They had to put that into God's hands. We have to put our livelihood into God's hands, don't we? Simeon and Anna had to surrender their cynicism, their maybe bitterness. Anna, widow for 77 years? had to surrender that hurt and know that God was in charge. Everybody has to surrender something to come to Jesus. And some of us are still fighting. Some of us are still holding on to all of those things. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to make it on my own. I don't need the crutch of Christianity. I don't need the crutch of religion. I can do it on my own. I'm going to be a self-made, independent man. I can fight my own battles. Thank you. Christianity is for weaklings. In November of 1917, American Staff Sergeant Henry Gunter arrived at the battlefields of northern France for what would be the final year of World War I. And Henry Gunter hated it. He was thousands of miles away from home. He was cold, homesick, depressed. He missed his fiance. He missed his comfortable job at a Baltimore bank. He hated everything about the battlefield in France. He was a staff sergeant. He wrote a friend back home 
about the miserable conditions he found himself in. And he encouraged his friend to do whatever he could to dodge the draft. That was a mistake. Because the army censor found his letter, read it, and reported Gunther's lack of patriotism to his supervisor, who busted him down from the rank of staff sergeant to private. His fiancée back home heard about the demotion and broke off the engagement. His buddies in the unit learned that Gunther himself was the son of German immigrants, and so they began to look at him as, with distrust and suspicion as, and his lack of patriotism. And so from that point on, Henry Gunther became obsessed with trying to get his reputation back. He volunteered for hazardous duty. He was the first out in front for any raid. He was doing whatever he could to win back his honor, to work really hard so that people would be convinced that he was an okay guy. And as the year progressed, Gunther got more and more nervous that he wouldn't have a chance to show himself honorable because there were rumors in the air about surrender. And he was afraid that the war would end before he had a chance to redeem himself. On the morning of November 11th, 1918, the men in Henry Gunther's unit learned of the armistice that had been signed at 5 a.m. that morning. The war would be over at 11 o'clock, which should have been good news for everybody in his unit. But it wasn't good news for Henry. Henry knew the time was running out for him to redeem his reputation. At 10.30 that morning, Gunther's unit is walking along a road near Metz, France. And they find their way blocked by two German machine gun nests. Now the Germans were under orders to open fire on anybody that came their way. But because they knew the war was just minutes away from ending, when they saw Gunther's unit, they fired their machine guns into the air. Henry Gunther charged. Against the orders of his superior officer, he ran at the German machine gunners with his bayonet fixed. The Germans tried to wave him off. They tried to use all of the broken English phrases they knew to tell him to back off. The war was almost over. But he kept on coming. And as he got closer, he opened fire. And at 10.59 a.m., one minute before the end of World War I, the German machine gunners turned their guns on Henry. And he became the last soldier to be killed in action in World War I. He was one of at least 2,738 troops that were killed between the hours of 5 a.m. and 11 a.m. on November 11, 1918. More than were killed on the beach on D-Day. More than the daily average of those that were killed on the Western Front during all of World War I, the daily average. 2,738 people who gave their lives even after the war was over. Now, a coach would use this as an inspiring locker room speech to say, you keep on fighting through the echo of the whistle. You keep on playing through the end of the play. And maybe that's a sermon for another day. But today, here's the point. 2,738 men, one of them, Henry Gunther, gave their lives after the war was over. Henry Gunther gave his life trying to redeem a reputation when the war was already over. And a lot of us today are still fighting, are still working, trying to redeem ourselves, trying to look good to everybody else, trying to be good enough when Jesus has already won the battle for us. I wonder if that's you. I wonder if you're looking for peace on earth because of what you can do and if so hear the message the war is over if you want it Jesus has won all we have to do is surrender and let him live through us would you pray with me Father?